killed all the rich. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Ryan very much contributed to this book with a very insightful interview. Uh, one of 130 that I did to try to put people into the negotiating room and feel the pressures that our negotiators are under. Uh, the book is full of uh, fascinating anecdotes, and Ron certainly helps us out. I want to also thank uh, Maria uh, Reifels, who's been uh, so very helpful in organizing this. Maria, thank you very much for your work, and I, I would take all of my time uh, if I recognized each of you personally, because each of you has had an important part in my life, and that is really the truth. So thank you all for coming, but also thank you for teaching me and for enriching my, my life. At a turbulent time, when the world's challenges and conflicts seem incapable of positive resolution. I wrote this book to achieve several goals. The first was to show that over the past 50 years with US leadership, diplomacy has been able to resolve difficult problems, difficult as we are faced with now, and if we can do it in the past, we can do it in the future as well. And I teach the lessons of how we reach success and why we sometimes fail to succeed. Second, I wanted to take a hard look at the use of military force by the United States as an instrument of diplomacy. Not in contrast to, but in combining it with diplomacy, in light of the experience that we've had during our lifetimes, going from Vietnam to the two Iraq wars, the two Balkan wars, um, Libya, Afghanistan, and now the hot wars in Ukraine and Gaza. What can we learn about when to use force, whether to use force, and how to use force? And third, at a time when I sense that there is a growing isolationism in this country. I wrote the book because I wanted to show how critically important U.S. engagement and leadership is to create a better world, and that if we withdraw from the world, if we disengage, that we will leave a vacuum in which Russia and China and others with very different values and very different interests will fill and we will have a world that is even more complex and more uncomfortable than it is today. Diplomacy, of course, is, is the management of international disputes through negotiation. But it's not like a game of poker in which it's winner take all. Diplomacy can only be successful if it creates a win-win situation for all the countries involved. Nor is it like a commercial negotiation, which is sort of dividing an economic pie. And when you have an agreement and a commercial negotiation, it's enforceable in a court or by arbitration. Almost all international agreements depend for their enforcement on the trust of the parties reaching. I call this book the art of diplomacy because there is an art to it. It's like an artist creating a painting on an empty easel. It is convincing the other side that it's in their interest to reach an agreement, which is in the U.S. interest as well. The starting point for success is choosing the right negotiator at the right time by the president. This is not a guarantee of success. If the parties are unwilling to compromise, if they don't engage and have an equity in the outcome, then even the best negotiator may fail. But at the same time, without a highly skilled negotiator, failure is much more certain. It's inconceivable to think of the opening to China without Henry Kissinger, or German reunification within NATO without Jim Baker, or Camp David without Jimmy Carter, or the Dayton Accords 
resolving the Bosnian War without defaulting. Negotiators bring a common set of skills. And let me give you examples of those. First, so really fierce determination to succeed, to seize the historic moment, to recognize that this is the time when success can be achieved when it's right to intervene. George H.W. Bush and his Secretary of State Jim Baker certainly understood that when the Berlin Wall fell. This was the time to act. This was the time to try to reunite the two Germanys and to do so within NATO. Rightness is a key issue. And rightness all occurs for two reasons. One, because the status quo is so painful that people decide it is time to change. It is time to negotiate and end to a conflict. Northern Ireland is a good example of that. And what is typical British understatement when they talk about the troubles in Northern Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants? Well, the troubles led to over 3,000 deaths, tens of thousands of people being maimed, and the Irish people, Catholic and Protestant, Unionist uh, and uh, Nationalist, simply said, we've got to end this, enough is enough. On the other hand, oftentimes the prospect for success creates an occasion for rightness. So, for example, Sadat, the president of Egypt, was desperate to get back to Sinai and to move from an alliance with the Soviet Union to one with the United States. On the other hand, although determination is crucial, it's also important that you not convey to your negotiating partners that you want to deal more than they do, that you're not willing to walk away from abandonment. And one example is what I did in Kyoto, leading the Kyoto Protocol negotiations with over 190 nations. After two weeks of negotiation and the final plenary, when we were voting on the final product, in alphabetical order, they came to you for the United States, and I said no. We voted no. Well, it shocked everybody. And I voted no because we could not get the European Union to give us the market-oriented measures that we needed to reduce the cost and the burden on U.S. industry of the emission reductions we were taking. That ended up breaking the ice. The head of the COP, the conference parties, got us in the green room, and we reached an agreement. But we wouldn't have if I had simply said, we want this agreement more than the EU does. A second attribute of a great negotiator is the courage to take risks. This is not the courage of the battlefield. It's the courage to break from the status quo. It's the courage to break oftentimes from your own political base. So that showed this when he made his dramatic trip to Jerusalem. He lost a foreign minister in the process, and by the way, lost the second one, in the midst of Camp David. The Crown Prince of the UAE, Mohammed bin Zayed, showed this in the Abraham Accords and normalizing relations with Israel. And again, it was shown in Northern Ireland. And here you had a unique combination of courage. It was the courage of the leaders of the Protestant community, Tremble, of the Catholic community, John Hume, of Sinn Fein and the IRA, uh, Jerry Adams, who I interviewed, and the almost simultaneous election of three young leaders, Clinton in the United States, Tony Blair in the UK, and Bernie Ahern in Ireland, who were willing to break from past beliefs, willing to take on their own political faces. I mean, Clinton, for example, was the first to visit Northern Ireland. He gave a visa to Jerry Adams, even with their connection to the IRA, the terrorist group, and absolutely led John Major, the foreign, the prime minister at the time, not to talk to Clinton for weeks. But they had the courage to act. Third is a high degree of intelligence, combined with wisdom and good judgment. This is certainly demonstrated by Henry Kissinger and Shoah Lao on the China Open. 
Next is something that Bob Lighthizer, the trade uh, minister for uh, President Trump talked about. He said preparation, preparation, and more preparation. You cannot go into a negotiation as a negotiator without really understanding the issues from every side, including the other side. More on that in a minute. Let me give you an anecdote to show what preparation does at Camp David. So we have 13 days of negotiation. President Carter drafts 20 separate peace agreements, which he shuttles between Fagan and his team and Sadat and his team. The 13th day comes, it's a Sunday morning. Sadat comes to Carter's cabin and he's willing to settle, but Fagan is not. And he says, Mr. President, I've compromised all that I can. I will not make any more compromises. I've got an L L plane at Andrews Air Force Base. Get me a limousine to take me out of Camp David. He said off the record, it was a glorified concentration camp. Uh, I will not make any more compromises. Well, Carter realized that this will undermine the historic trip that Sadat had made. He comes back to Cairo empty-handed. He could literally be assassinated. It will undermine his own presidency. And so preparation here, remembering from the CIA profiles of Sadat and Megan, that they can have a great love for his eight grandchildren. So he gets his personal secretary, Susan Cloud, to make eight copies of the original photograph taken of the three leaders, Sadat, Bacon, and Carter, when they first came to Camp David autographs each personally to a grandchild with best wishes for peace, Jimmy Carter, walks it over to Sadat's cabin, hands it to, to excuse me, to Bagan's cabin, sees Bagan vocalize each name. His ear, his eyes tear, his lips quiver, he puts his bag down, and he said, I'll make one last try. And that preparation ended up being absolutely crucial. Another attribute, which may sound unusual, is the ability to listen, to listen to the other side. What are they saying? How are they saying it? What's their body language? What is a real red line and what isn't? It's what Larry Summers, the Treasury Secretary, when I was his deputy, called unsympathetic empathy for the other side. Next is building trust through personal relationships. You cannot see your adversary as someone to be defeated and humiliated. You have to make them a partner in the enterprise of reaching an agreement. President George H.W. Bush was urged by his political staff when the wall fell in Berlin in 1989 to do a victory dance in Berlin. I mean, just think of a political advantage. And Bush said, no, if I do that, I will undermine my relationship with Gorbachev, who I need to get to agree on German unification, and he didn't. And similarly, in the German unification talks, another example of personal relationships was Jim Baker himself. At a very critical time in negotiations, he took Foreign Minister Shevardnadze, the Soviet Union's foreign minister, out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, to his retreat, spent several days with him, and yes, they certainly negotiated, but they broke down personal barriers. They talked about their families. They talked about the importance of peace for their children and grandchildren. And that personal relationship was absolutely critical. In my Holocaust negotiations, I was very fortunate to have as a negotiating partner, uh, Count Al Lansdorf, who I had known as the economic minister in the Schmidt government during the Carter administration, but who I knew had a very deep commitment to right the wrongs of World War II. He was absolutely committed that these negotiations for slave labor were going to succeed. And the personal relationship that Count Lansdorff and I had certainly was a crucial factor. Next is creativity. And that's again why I call it the art of diplomacy. Because you need to be creative to get around the inevitable impasses that will always occur Sometimes that comes from using ambiguous language. For example, after the 1967 
Six-day war. The UN resolution talks about uh, land for peace, that Israel has to withdraw from territories, but they didn't defend which territories. There wouldn't have been a UN resolution if they had tried to do that. Richard Holbrook at the Dayton Accords used a combination of bluster, threats of renewed military force against Milosevic, and what General Clark, his military aide, called innovative jazz to come up with the Dayton Accords. Another example is George Mitchell uh, negotiating the Good Friday Agreement. There were 13 political parties involved. And there was enormous distrust because those political parties, at least the major ones, had separate militias, very well armed, and literally in the midst of the talks, still killing each other. And so the commitment was, we can't negotiate if these militias don't disarm. But they wouldn't disarm because they distrusted the other side so much. So he came up creatively with what became known as the Mitchell Principle. Namely, the militias did not have to disarm, but everyone had to sign a document committing themselves to a non-violent solution to the process. More on that in a minute. Another lesson is not to swing, if I can use a baseball term, for home runs. Because if you do, you'll oftentimes strike out Rather, go for limited agreements that you can build on and defer the more difficult issues to the future. Two examples, Camp David again. The Palestinians were not at Camp David. They refused to accept UN Revolution 2.2. So this became a bilateral agreement between Egypt and Israel, which is now held for more than 40 years, but it did not resolve the Palestinian issue. Of course, we're still dealing with that. But the fact is, we would never have reached the bilateral agreement if we tried to pull, put too much on it. Again, the Good Friday Agreement is an example of not swinging for home runs. If you think of the two major issues that had to be resolved between the Catholic and Protestant communities, the Angelists and the Unionists, it was first, what's the fate of Northern Ireland? Is it going to be part of the Irish Republic and the South? or part of Great Britain. And second, what are we going to do finally with these arms? Well, the Good Friday Agreement resolved neither one of those. To this day, the referendum that is supposed to resolve the future status of Northern Ireland has never been held. And it may never be held because the agreement created a sense of trust and confidence in the communities. So the people are saying, let's not cross that bridge, let's leave things well enough alone. And it took, believe it or not, nine years after the Good Friday Agreement before there was enough trust for the decommissioning of arms. Another attribute of a successful negotiator is stamina. These negotiations require years, patience. They're like running a marathon with a sprint at the end, with the Olympics coming up. You've got to have the ability and the stamina to keep going. Two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, to think clearly, to go on a little sleep. The term shuttle diplomacy was given to Henry Kissinger spending two weeks after the 1973 Young Kippur War, shuttling between Syria and Egypt and, uh, and uh, doing this repeatedly over a two week period, going to Jerusalem, going to Damascus, uh, going to Cairo. And the term shuttle diplomacy really came from the fact that he did this with almost no sleep. Jimmy Carter got an average of two or three hours of sleep over 13 days at Camp David. And when I was doing the Kyoto negotiations, we got an average of two or three hours of sleep as well. Another requirement is to have the confidence of the president and the White House staff. The other side has to know that when you're putting an offer down on the table, you're not speaking for yourself and you are representing the highest levels of the U.S. government. Otherwise, they'll have no confidence in what you're putting down. 
Jim Baker has said that he could never have gotten German reunification if people didn't know that he and President Bush were so close. And interestingly, Kissinger said to me, people think I had a bad relationship with Nixon. He said, I did not. If Nixon hadn't given me the full backing and confidence, I could never have negotiated what I did in the Middle East or in China. Next is the use of back channels or what is sometimes called track two negotiations. Sometimes the parties are so antagonistic, they literally will not get in the same room with each other. So, for example, the, the famous Oslo Accords, in which the PLO and Israel mutually recognized each other, started when Yossi Balin secretly got back channel talks with the PLO that could not have been held publicly. And indeed, he said that he sweated bullets and lost a year in his life when he finally surfaced the aversion agreement and presented it to Foreign Minister Paris and to Prime Minister Levine, hoping beyond hope that they would accept it, which of course they did. But it could not have been done without that back channel. Kissinger's opening to China was done by using the president of Pakistan's plane to go into to, to China. The reason we had the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement in 2015 with Iran, is because John Kerry used the Sultan of Oman as the boost, as a trusted intermediary when the two sides wouldn't talk with each other. And most recently, the first hostage deal uh, in Gaza was reached again by back channels with Qatar and Egypt and the United States uh, negotiating separately with Israel and Hamas because they wouldn't get in the same room together and they still won't and probably never will. Next is the ability to use leverage. Leverage is something we all understand when we're negotiating with our kids, when we're negotiating with our spouses and partners, when we're negotiating business deals, but the creative use of leverage is absolutely crucial. And this can be positive and negative leverage. The positive leverage comes from providing incentives for the other side, opening our vast market, for example, to the goods of a foreign country. Or as we did in Camp David and the treaty with Egypt, giving F-5 fighter jets to Egypt, or more recently, greasing the wheels for the Abraham Accords with the UAE and Israel by F-35 fighter jets to the UAE, which they desperately wanted. There are negative sanctions, negative incentives, which come, for example, from sanctions. I could spend all day talking about sanctions, and I won't, except to say I was called the sanctions meister in the Clinton administration. I did a huge number of sanction negotiations, and they ain't what they used to be. We don't have the power and the leverage that we used to when other countries now have the ability to provide goods that we used to have a monopoly on. Otherwise, the sanctions against Russia, Iran, North Korea, or Venezuela would be more effective than they are. Reputational damage can also be important. And I found this out in doing the Holocaust negotiations. The leverage that I had wasn't from the fact that I could beat up on Swiss banks or German slave labor companies, because after all, these were our allies. I could only go so far. But outside groups, the World Jewish Congress, uh, survivor groups, class action lawyers, put ads out in papers threatening to withdraw business. Uh, the controller of the uh, city of New York threatened to withdraw all the pension funds from the Swiss banks. This created leverage that helped me negotiate those agreements. The ultimate leverage negatively is military force. And I'll close with this. Military force can be an effective instrument of diplomacy if it's based on accurate intelligence about the enemy's capabilities, if it's linked to achievable political objectives, if it's employed with decisiveness and allied support, and if it's backed up by humanitarian assistance and economic development. It should clearly be the last option after all other means of exhaustion. It should be only used when it's in the supreme national interest 
of the United States. But here are one of the interesting lessons that I think I got from the book, and I'd like to impart. And that is that before the first bullet is fired, before the first bullet is fired, there needs to be a political plan for the day after. There needs to be a buy-in with the military, what we're trying to achieve. Military, of course, is by definition disruptive. So what comes after? And oftentimes, as Steve Hadley, the National Security Advisor and Congolese Vice Secretary of uh, State, and in a very candid interview, said to me, and looking back at the Iraq war and posting Saddam Hussein, we got it backward. We started the war without realizing what would happen when Saddam was gone. What was the political objective? So that is absolutely crucial. Bush won got it right. He had a limited political objective, which was simply to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Remember the criticism that he and Colin Powell received? You've now got Saddam by the neck take Baghdad and get rid of them. And they said, no, if we do that, we'll own Baghdad. He had a limited objective. His son, unfortunately, later missed the lessons of his father trying to get too much. And this gets to the next question, and that is using decisive force. If you're going to use military force, it needs to be what Colin Powell called decisive force. Again, George H.W. Bush got 500,000 troops, 38 countries, a UN resolution, NATO resolution. That was decisive. In contrast, Bush II and Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, divided our forces between Afghanistan and Iraq, did not use decisive force in either, and used what Rumsfeld called a light footprint exactly the opposite of the decisive force that Bush won realized. In addition, before you invade another country, you need to understand their culture, their history, their internal politics before you invade. General Petraeus said to me in his interview, you need to have a nuanced understanding of the country before you invade, and he oftentimes don't. Bob Gates, Secretary of Defense, said we overestimated what military force could achieve politically in Iraq. Mike Tyson, the former heavyweight champion, said it very well. Everyone has a plan until they get in a ring and are hit in the face. <laughs> so, for example, in the Kosovo War, we mistakenly bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. They still believe, they literally still believe this was done on purpose. Good intelligence is also crucial. The Iraq War is a textbook example of bad intelligence. And here's something that I think I found that is quite novel. We all know there were no weapons of mass destruction. That's a given. That Saddam didn't have it. What's not well known is that Saddam had actually destroyed his weapons of mass destruction in compliance with the UN resolutions. But he wouldn't admit it publicly because he was afraid it would weaken him domestically with his opponents and would invite a invasion by Iran. That was a miscalculation which cost his life. It cost the lives of several thousand uh, Iraqi and American soldiers. I was in a White House that received maybe the worst intelligence in American history, certainly close to, and this is on Iran. And I want to be very honest with you. Six weeks before the Shaw left six weeks. The CIA sent to the president, and I've got the actual CIA report, which said, Iran is in neither a revolutionary nor even a pre-revolutionary state. Six weeks later, the Shaw leaves because of the revolution. The CIA didn't know that the Shaw had incurable cancer. We didn't understand the nature of Khomeini. Well, how can you make sound decisions when you get intelligence like that? So I'll conclude, and I know we'll have questions on Ukraine and Gaza, by saying that as Secretary of State Blinken told me in, in his interview, 
to strengthen American diplomacy, we have to also be strong at home. We have to strengthen our democratic institutions. We have to strengthen our, our military and economic institutions. We have to try to reduce our bitter internal polarization because if you're negotiating with another country and at home, the opposition party is undercutting you, it doesn't leave you in a position of strength. There's no higher purpose for this country than to leverage its strength, its influence, and its values to engage diplomacy, to reduce conflicts, and meet our 21st century challenges. The alternative is to withdraw from active diplomacy, which will lead to an even more unstable and lawless world. Thank you, and I'm to take care. Thank you. Well, let me just to tell you one humorous story before the question period, which is uh, one I got from Russell Long, who was the uh, senator from Louisiana, the senior senator and the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, with whom we did much work. And he was the son of the famous Huey Long, the populist governor of Louisiana in the 20s and early 30s. And he told me the following story, that when he was a young boy growing up in Baton Rouge in the governor's mansion, Papa came home to the governor's mansion, just stone cold drunk and with a very shaky hand, got the key and the keyhole to the line, and then collapsed in the foyer of the governor's mansion. And Russell said, I was holding mama's apron strings, waiting to see the explanation of how this state of affairs could occur to the governor of the great state of Louisiana. And he said, Papa said to mama, mama, I've completed my prepared remarks. I'm now taking questions to the floor. <laughs> I assure you that I only have one, and I'll be glad to take it. But, Sue, thank you for absolutely great, great presentation. And uh, really, this book, uh, which I have read, it, it seems to me to be one that's going to be a textbook for people engaged in study negotiations for some time, particularly because of the way you've gone through so many different kinds of negotiations. And the fact that they don't just follow one kind of script. I wanted to get into two contemporary questions, uh, perhaps one at a time, then we'll go to others. Uh, you talked about the use of force before, uh, before you get into something, and you talked about the threat of force in negotiations. When you have to negotiate with an ongoing war. Uh, there's an interrelationship of force and diplomacy. Uh, there's a geometry of the battlefield that affects the negotiations. There are questions of timing uh, as to when you begin things. And I, I think this is an area I'd like you to reflect on because I think it's not well understood. We see a lot of commentary uh, in the press about negotiating strategies that seem to be completely divorced from what happens on the outfield. Uh, we, uh, well, I think one of the most familiar comments you hear, especially from Americans, is we have to stop the fighting so we can negotiate, which has always struck me as absurd because when you do that, you either get a frozen conflict like Cyprus or Lebanon, uh, or you get a negotiation that breaks down. But you know, I, I don't know very many that get resolved that way. So I wanted to ask you to reflect as you wish on the interrelationship of force and diplomacy, particularly in the case of Ukraine, where it's not us, and how one ought to be thinking about uh, the tactics of trying to get into negotiations, not just the principles of what a solution could look like. Thank you, Ron. Well, I, I mean, one of the things I try to stress in the book is that, that military force and diplomacy are not separate things. They really have to be combined. And Henry Kissinger said in his interview that you don't win at the negotiating table what you can't achieve on the battlefield. Because you can't achieve on the battlefield a sufficient uh, incentive for the other side to negotiate, you're not going to be successful. That's why it's so important to arm Ukraine. That's why the six-month delay in Congress providing aid 
to Ukraine. Why the delay in getting F-16s and Abrams tanks and missiles by Biden administration has been so difficult because it really reduced the leverage that the Ukrainians had earlier in the war to negotiate a better deal. Now it's really critically important that we keep that up. And if we don't keep it up, we're going to end up with a Munich II. It's going to be the repeat of 1938. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that the most that can be hoped for at this point is that the Ukrainians can take back this summer uh, and what remains of the fighting season in Ukraine as much as they can of the roughly 18% of the Ukrainian territory that the Russians have taken. They're not going to get it all back no matter how long they fight. And this war will end when each side realizes that they can't achieve anything further on the battlefield without losses that are unsustainable. There will come a time when that realization occurs. But I think there won't be a formal peace treaty. I think what we're going to see is something like the 1953 Korean armistice where it was not a formal treaty, and there is not to this day a formal treaty, and yet there's been no war for 70 years between North and South Korea. Uh, Cyprus is another example. We have a green line. There's been no further fighting between the northern part and the southern part. I think that's what's going to end up happening. Now, having said that, how do you avoid handing Putin a victory on a platter for his aggression. And the best I think that can be done is the following. First, we cannot negotiate behind Zelensky's back. I went into this in great detail with Kissinger. We negotiated two agreements, one on ending the Vietnam War and one on ending the Afghan War without the governments we were fighting for in the room. South Vietnam government was not a party to the Paris Peace Talks. And when we negotiated in the Trump administration, then led in the Biden administration with the Taliban, the government of Afghanistan was not there. Tony was the, was the deputy chief mission and uh, the ambassador on economic issues. I mean, 20 years we spent there, and yet they're not there. And then we blame Donnie for deserting when they weren't part of the deal to begin with. So this is Zelensky's territory. He has to make the decision. Now, for sure, we're supplying arms, we're supplying money. We can only do that indefinitely, not indefinitely. But we cannot try to negotiate behind this rule. So that's the first, first and second. We should not recognize any of the remaining territory that Russia ends up having as sovereign territory of Russia. We cannot do it. And third, we should not end any of the sanctions. Now, that's why I think there'll be no treaty, because otherwise we give everything to Putin. He gets no sanctions. He gets to keep the territory. He gets the clarity and the humility as theirs. Uh, and I, I can't see how there's any way in which the Ukrainian government can agree to that. Now, one last thing, and this is really, really critical. You know, there's an old proverb that says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, we have been fooled twice, twice by Putin. First in 1994, in what was called the Budapest Memorandum, in which he got Ukraine to give up what was then the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world in return for the commitment that he would not further invade Ukraine. Well, what does he do? He goes into Crimea and annexes Crimea. Then the second time in the so-called Minsk agreements, one and two in 2014 and 2015, to end the Donbass fighting with the so-called little green men that he sent in, 
we signed, we, the United States of America, with the UK, with Russia, and with Ukraine, in writing a quote unquote assurance that he, Putin, would not go further into Ukraine. Three days before the February 24, 2022 invasion, on February 21st, Putin says publicly, Minsk does not exist anymore. He just rips it apart and invades, tries to take over the key and, and the whole country. So Zelensky tried to say to us, wait a minute, you want me to stop fighting? You want me to negotiate? How do I know we won't get fooled a third time? That Putin won't simply stop, reload, and launch all over again. Now, we're not going to give them the NATO guarantee of Article 5 because it'll take too long to do it. I think there's too much nervousness. But maybe there are tripwires. Maybe with Sean here and Tony, I mean, with your EU knowledge, maybe it's EU membership. It will be more difficult, I think, for Putin to invade an EU country. Maybe it's leading some NATO trainers. Uh, but we've got to start thinking about how we create a sufficient guarantee so that Zelensky feels he can negotiate even while he's fighting. At, at the risk of not leaving any time for anybody else, I'm going to ask you one more question, mostly because you're not talking about it. And this is Gaza. And in Gaza, you have a situation in which there seems to be very little room, a critical need for negotiation, and extremely little will on the part of either side to acknowledge that they can't have more for a whole lot of reasons. And I think that whole situation is a long talk, which I won't ask you to get into. But I would ask you to reflect on the role of the United States in that war where we have particular amounts of leverage and particular domestic constraints and using it and which is becoming an intensively divisive area in our country. So let me just leave that open for you for a few minutes but then I'll hope to make some more questions. Let me start uh, with one bottom line that may sound controversial but I, I think that a must has to be if not defeated in a total victory, disabled from being a governing and military force. No sovereign country can allow a government, and Hamas is in fact a government, Gaza, that is committed directly to the extermination of Israel to continue to be a governing uh, force and a military force. It's simply not, not possible. Having said that, Having said that, there are a number of lessons from the book, and let me mention them. The first is, Israel did not learn from our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. They had, with the vaunted Mossad, extremely poor intelligence. They didn't understand, and I've been briefed by two Israeli generals on this for a think tank in Jerusalem by a co-chair of Dennis Ross, that in a two or three year period, Hamas had morphed from being a terrorist group that would send occasional bombers in or terrorists in to do damage from a terrorist group into a full blown terrorist army with 30 to 40,000 well trained, well armed uh, troops, very disciplined, and 300 miles of tunnels, some of which are 80 meters deep. Now, it's inconceivable that they didn't, and they had the most size design, effective when the war ends. Second, there was no more time plan before they got in, although we begged them to get one, and we begged them to this very day to have a post-war plan. Who governs after the Hamas? Israel does not want to have a permanent presence there, but somebody has to. And not having a plan to begin with creates a terrible vacuum because otherwise the IDF will have to stay indefinitely and do what it doesn't want to do. Now, just within the last week, 
Admiral Nagari, who's the chief spokesman for the IDF, said publicly, quite remarkably, Hamas cannot be destroyed. Hamas is an idea. Those who think it can be made to disappear are wrong. So it's got to be weakened. But somehow we've got to find a negotiating partner that doesn't exist by Hamas. Hamas wants to stay in power. Israel doesn't want to stay in power. There's no bridge between that. And it's going to be very difficult to get the rest of the Arab countries involved. So here is my notion. First of all, General Petraeus, who turned around the Iraq war, said he had three clear doctrines. Clear an area from terrorists. Hold the area from terrorists. But third, build. Build so that the non-combatants, the civilians, understand that you're trying to leave them with a better life than they had under the preceding government. And that's certainly not the message that's been received yet uh, to Gaza. But in addition, and more broadly, we have to look at Gaza in a regional context and not isolated. The regional context is this. Israel's real security will come from being part of a Sunni Arab coalition with countries they've already gotten peace agreements with, with Egypt, with Jordan, with Bahrain, with Morocco, with the UAE, and ultimately with the Saudis against the Iranian so-called axis of resistance. That's their real security, but that can't happen unless they're willing to make some commitment to an eventual Palestinian state. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. It doesn't have to take all the borders to plan. But at least some commitment to that. And this government in Israel is not able to make that. And unless they can, there won't be such a coalition, and Israel will be more and more isolated. So to me, it's desperately important that Israel will be part of this moderate Sunni Arab coalition, which would be also led by the US and the EU. Uh, and for that, it's up to the Israeli public. I want to say to you on this that. that um, to talk to both Israeli relatives and friends and looking at the public opinion polls, that even the moderate left in Israel is opposed to a Palestinian state at this point. They see it as ultimately becoming a Hamas state. So the Israeli public will have a very tough choice because at some point they will, in my opinion, have to agree to some horizon in which there is a Palestinian state, or they'll be isolated and not take advantage of the coalition which is there for the making. And that's their greatest protection against Iran and its boxes. Thank you, Sue. Because you described me and you remind me of that saying that you don't know where you're going and the boat will get you there. Um, <coughs> let's take a question or two. Who's got what? Got two votes here. Bill, here, let me hand your mic to the people who are following me. Uh, source, it was a tour de force, too. Unbelievably beautiful, the Puerto Rican book. Uh, and I just want to commend you for, frankly, all the experience that went into you being able to draw out all these lessons and this wisdom for us. It's going to be a valuable book. My question for you is this. There is, I think, not just in the United States, but worldwide, less of an openness to negotiation. There's a greater divisiveness, whether it be coming from the balkanization of social media, whatever it is. To what extent does that inability at a domestic level, domestic politics to negotiate, have an impact on international diplomacy? But it's a great question, and it has a huge impact. I mean, to the extent that you're negotiating with a foreign government, uh, or a foreign uh, opponent, and you don't have a broad base of domestic support, it doesn't provide a credibility that you need. And let me also give you an example that doesn't even involve the, the use of force and, and make a contrast. And that is, there is a tendency by presidents, and I've now served six, that when you're elected, your automatic instinct is to go against whatever your predecessor's done. I can do it better. Now, let me give an example on, on each side. 
When Ronald Reagan was elected uh, overwhelmingly against us in 1980, he had campaigned against the Salt II nuclear agreement. And yet, for the full term of seven years, he enforced the agreement because he realized that a former president had reached it, even though the Senate had read of him, and the continuity was tremendously important, and he built on that to start treaty and deep with us. In contrast, whatever one thinks about the 2015 nuclear agreement with Iran, I think it was better than nothing. Uh, when President Trump unilaterally pulled out because Obama had negotiated it, it created a vacuum in which Iran has now been able to reinforce its, uh, its uranium and really break through the agreement. Another example happened in my area with climate change. We are either in or out of climate change, depending on who wins the next election. Bush one, Bush two, Trump, all are opposed to any sort of binding emission reductions. The Democratic presidents, you know, Clinton and Obama and Biden are for it. Well, how can you negotiate when at home the public will make a decision which will basically mean whether we're continuing to stay in or not? I mean, you can't ask another country to take deep emission reductions and to do better if they know that, depending on the next election, we're not going to potentially be in. So it is a huge effect. Now, you know, Senator Vandenberg said many years ago, many decades ago, and maybe this is a forlorn hope, that, uh, you know, part of parts should, should end at the water's edge. Uh, we've got to have some recognition that there are limits to partisan politics and foreign policy is one of the really critical areas where there is definitely a need for Maria, do we have any other uh, you don't know, want to you tell us who the other one. We have a question from Ambassador Marsteris, who wanted to know your thoughts on the management of press and public opinion during the negotiation of particularly important effects in Gaza, of course. So Chris Devine has been put in, in a terrible line. He's been very supportive of Israel. Uh, and yet, the Prime Minister remarkably said just last week publicly on an English language uh, broadcast uh, that because Israel was not getting sufficient ammunition and weapons, it was uh, at risk of not winning the war. And it's a remarkable thing. Uh, the management of public opinion on Middle East negotiations is really good because of the Jewish community, the Muslim community. It's a very highly charged political issue. Young voters, voters of color, it's a very important issue. I went to Columbia uh, University uh, to see for myself the demonstrations. I talked to six Jewish students at Harvard Law School. The presidents of Emory and Dartmouth have both been censured because they, they brought out to the police to deal with the demonstrators who weren't obeying the rules. So there's an extremely high uh, domestic content to this. Now, I think that President Biden has threaded the deal as well as he's done. His plan for the hostages and for eventual permanent ceasefire, the three-stage process is a good one, which Israel actually has accepted. And Hamas three times has rejected it because they think that time is on their side. The longer they wait, the more division there will be. Already three EU countries have unilaterally recognized the Palestinian state. We see what's happening on campuses. And I want to tell you, we're talking about Deja Vu all, all over again, as Tony Burns said. I was at the 1968 Democratic Convention when I was on Hubert Elmer's stay. I was in Blackstone Hotel. I could still smell the tear gas from Mayor Haley's police uh, over Vietnam at the time. We're going to see a potential repeat of that in Chicago, in the same city, in the Democratic Convention. And that is going to be the collision of domestic politics and foreign policy writ large. Well, that's a cheerful note. Let me see, do we have one more optimistic question in the room? We're just about out of time, but if somebody's got a burning desire, I didn't want to 
But I just I do want to know because you never know the mystery of hell is that we're all always fighting that occurs with our allies and with others. They really do want this leadership. They really do want it. And we're the only country that is still a military and political and diplomatic superpower. We have the capabilities, we just need the will to continue to engage. Because if we don't, again, it would be catastrophic to pay it. But I just pray, however this election turns out, that there'll be enough people who realize the importance of U.S. leadership in the world. It's still critically important, and we still have the tools. We need more allies. We, we don't have the power, surely, we did right after the Cold War. But we still are the preeminent power, and we have the right values and the right interests and the right tools. Well, it's a good note to close on. It. I have often reflected on the fact that of all the countries that have had sort of imperial or quasi imperial powers in the world, I think none has ever been as reluctant to use it as the United States. Uh, but we do not have a replacement. So, on that, you know, can I slip in a quick question? If it's really, 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 if it has a really short answer, one tiny piece of this complex tableau, and that is um, we do have a nuanced, deep understanding of foreign cultures and politics and history. We have people with that knowledge um, in our foreign service and elsewhere. What can be done so that those people are listened to or at least have access to the people making these decisions that you've described or these misdecisions? Well, I mean, that was a political point to use in this. Uh, but I will add on people like Tony and, and um, you know, Sean and others. Uh, but let me give you an example of how we didn't understand. I mean, we really did not understand under Bush II when we went into Iraq that we were imposing a minority Sunni dictator in a majority Shiite country. And what the implications were for that. We sent over a, quite a, a very good right guy, Jerry Bremer, but his two first resolutions were to dissolve the entire Iraqi army and send them home without any pay or with their guns. Uh, and uh, to depathesize the country, like it's the end of World War II, the Nazis, without realizing that many of the people who had their jobs, government jobs, had to belong to the past point. So it's the lack of that kind of understanding that can lead to catastrophic results. And that means that political people like myself have to do a better job of listening to the career people. But oftentimes, I can tell you, I've done the White House several times, several administrations, that when those decisions are made, the career people are generally not there. You know, Susan, I... I Congratulate you on the optimism of that question. You, it does remind me of an answer that George Cannon gave in a speech about 1961, who said that diplomacy, and I'm paraphrasing, is, requires that you serve people who do not know they need to be served, who do not know that you should be serving them, and who would not thank you if they did know. So we may be at this goal. Still, thank you for the moment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.